Hello, everyone. Uh, we have a tradition here in Middle East Studies. We don't do introductions. All of you should have a sheet that has a name and the bio and the topic of the talk. But since this is being live streamed and recorded and will probably be viewed by many people than there are in this room, let me do a tiny introduction. My name is Bishar Dumani. I'm Director of Middle East Studies here at Brown University and a professor in the Department of History. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Elias Mohanda from the Department of Comparative Literature who will be speaking on the topic translating a classical Arabic encyclopedia. Um, for those of you who follow the New York Review of Books, you've probably seen it reviewed there. It's also outside this hallway for sale and signing by the author. Um, a quick personal word, uh, Elias and I came to Brown together in 2012. Um, uh, he's been an amazing uh, teacher. Uh, his classes are very popular. The students love him. He does uh, a lot of advising for both the Department of Comparative Literature and Middle East Studies. Um, he's been incredibly productive uh, here. Uh, he single-handedly put together the Digital Islamic Humanities Conference Series, which has been going on every year since we got here a rock-solid citizen of Middle East Studies and of the department and of the university as a whole. He's also a faculty fellow here at the Watson Institute. Um, in fact, he submitted yet another manuscript to the press just the day before yesterday. So he's on a roll, and we're very happy to see that. Um, I uh, uh, can't imagine how we've gotten so much done here in Middle East Studies in the last four or five years without Yes being with us. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and without further ado, this uh, let me, please help me welcome Yes Muhammad. Thank you, Bashara. And thanks to everybody for coming. Um, I actually have to go teach at 1 o'clock, shortly before 1. So I'm going to be brief um, and leave as much time as possible for discussion. Um, you take my <laughs> talk, by any chance? Your talk? No. Uh, yes, yes, you did. Um, I won't be needing this. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be here to talk about a project, um, a, a book that I've been working with and thinking uh, about now for almost, for almost 10 years, actually. Um, I began reading this text um, and thinking about it uh, when I was a graduate student. And my, so my, my work began, uh, really, it was in the framework of a doctoral dissertation which then became a, uh, a study, an academic study, which Bashar mentioned I just sent off to uh, the, the publisher a couple days ago. But in the meantime, I, I also produced this translation that I want to talk to you about today. Um, and I thought maybe the best thing to do would be to just provide a little bit of background on the text, uh, on what is distinctive about it and why I found it interesting, and then maybe leave some of the discussion about uh, the actual process of translation until the to the, the Q and A, um, just because it otherwise it'll it could sort of wander and, and we won't have time for a discussion. So um, the author of the text, uh, his name is Shahab al-Din Ahmed ibn Abdul Wahhab al Um He lived in the Mamluk Empire. The Mamluk Empire ruled over, or the Mamluk Sultanate ruled over most of Egypt um, and much of Syria, present-day Lebanon, Palestine, Israel, um, and also held sovereignty over the, the holy uh, cities um, in, from basically the mid-13th century until the beginning of the 16th century. And then they were removed um, by the Ottoman Empire. So they preceded the Ottoman Empire um, in this particular region. And this fellow, Shahab al was a Nuwaiti, um, he was a bureaucrat. He worked for the Sultanate, and he served uh, essentially as a financial administrator, which means that he was a manager. He was uh, 
he was the person, or he was one of many people who got things done in the empire. Uh, he held different jobs. He worked as a secretary of the army for a while. He worked um, handling things like taxation and that sort of thing. He also worked for the chancery, where he was in charge of, um, which was essentially like the, the secretary of the State Department um, in this particular context. And he was very close to the Sultan uh, at the time, Sultan uh, Nasr Muhammad, who ruled over, um, he had three periods of, he reigned for three different periods, but his last reign, 1310 to 1341, was is really seen as a, um, a period of stability and uh, is tremendously important for this, for this period. So in Nuwaiti, at some point in the 1310s, uh, at the, in, the, in his 30s, he decided to leave his scribal career, although he was very successful. And he decided to devote his, the rest of his life to the composition of an encyclopedia. Um, and this is what the work looks like. It's the one up on the, on the top, uh, which is much, much larger than this particular text. Um, in the original, um, in the original manuscript, it's th 31 volumes, which sounds like a huge size, and it is. But what is remarkable about this period is that this text was not remarkable. That's what's interesting about it. In Nuwaiti's book, if you read the biographies of him in, in the biographical literature in the Onomastica, um, they don't say that he wrote the greatest, he was the author of the largest encyclopedia ever written. He was just the author of a, a work of history, they call it. Other people call it other things. Uh, but this period in particular, the early 14th century, well, really the 14th century into the 15th century in the, Arab, in the Arabic speaking world was a period of encyclopedic production. Um, and the book that I just sent to the publisher two days ago is about the period and is about the book and tries to explain why we see this huge production of encyclopedic literature in the 14th century. So, um, and here are some other examples of works composed within less than 100 years of a new AD, which are sim similarly bulky. So, what is, what is in this book? Well, it is composed, it's composed of five parts, and each part has five sections, and each section has multiple chapters. It's, it's organized very systematically. The first part is on heaven and earth. The second deals with the human being. The third is on animals, <coughs> plants, and then finally, history. And each, each one of these parts has uh, multiple sections. So you can drill down into, let's say, part four. <laughs> section two is on trees and fruit. In the section on trees and fruit, we have three chapters. A chapter on trees whose fruit has an inedible peel, trees whose fruit has an inedible stone, <laughs> and trees whose fruit has neither peel nor stone. And within this chapter, we have multiple subchapters. On the trees whose fruit has an inedible peel, you have the, your nuts, you know, hazelnut, pistachio, chestnut. And then into the, with the inedible stone, it's your stone fruit plums and peaches and so on. And then we have things like grapes and figs and so on. This image is actually not from this text, but from one of the other ones that you saw on the shelf uh, that was composed probably 20 or 30 years after Nuwaiti's book. So what happens when you go beyond that and you take a, a sample chapter like the chapter on the fig? You have all kinds, Nuwaiti has all sorts of um, genres of material that he puts into his various chapters. For example, on the fig, we have um, a quote from a, an early um, naturalist, Islamic authority on natural science called Ibn Wahshiya, on the generation of the fig. If you mix equal parts fresh mandrake root and branch with honey and wax and plant this in the ground the way you would plant anything and pour enough water over it at the time of the planting such that you know the water will reach the root and then leave it alone without adding any more water then a yellow fig tree will grow from it with intensely sweet figs and if you mix it into the mandrake four cloves of garlic and an onion and pound the whole mixture together and plant it you'll have figs whose color is between an intense black and red <laughs> 
obviously nonsense. And yet, some preserved for some reason in the encyclopedia. Along the same lines, a judge whose word is respected and who is deemed trustworthy once told me about a kind of black fig found in Alexandria, <laughs> which is called El Hurabi. When the figs ripen, they become covered in white markings, and sometimes one may be found that has the name of God written upon it. He also informed me that he had seen many such figs, and that he had been told by trustworthy people that some figs even had the phrase, there is no God but God, and Muhammad is the prophet of God, written upon it. I asked him if it was possible that this could be the result of someone's trickery, and he said, no, this is a natural creation produced by God most high. Praise be to he who is capable of all things. So I offer these examples just by way of um, trying to create the sensation in you that I had when I first started reading this text and started working on it, which at the time, as I said, um, I was a graduate student, and I had moved to I had moved to Beirut to be near my family while I was reading this text because I, I had a year to, to work on it uh, before I had to start writing and I could do it from anywhere, so I moved back home. And when I think about it, um, when I think about that year, it felt at times as though I had actually moved to a very strange and exotic country, which was not to say which I, I, I began to think of as the land of the ultimate ambition. It wasn't so, because I, I spent every day sitting in a room reading this text. So that isn't to say that I felt that I had moved to 14th century Egypt, which is where the text was composed, but rather I felt like I had moved to a society that, um, or I had moved to uh, a place that was a kind of cumulative pan-chronic re reflection, one might say, of a much larger centuries-old civilizational archive. It was, to paraphrase Borges, the most eloquent spokesman of the encyclopedic form, a, quote, vast and systematic fragment of the entire history of an unknown planet, with its architectures and its playing cards, the horrors of its mythologies and the murmur of its tongues, its emperors and its seas, its minerals and its birds and fishes, its algebra and its fire, its theological and metaphysical controversies, all joined, articulated, coherent, and with no visible doctrinal purpose or hint of parody. That was very much my sense uh, when I was reading this because it, there was so much material that didn't make sense to me. Like why, would you, why would you include this material? Why would you include this nonsensical agronomical material in a, in a text like this. When this fellow grew up in, he grew up in the Egyptian countryside. He knew how figs were grown. It wasn't with mandrake root. Um, so why did, why did he do this? And I discovered in the course of working on this text that this was actually the case, this is actually um, a symptom of much encyclopedic literature beyond the Islamic context. I became very interested in encyclopedic texts in the European tradition, um, in the ancient tradition, ancient Greek, ancient Rome, uh, the Chinese tradition, and you find, in fact, a lot of this sort of nonsensical, what you could call literary empirical material, especially in the, in the material about animals. For example, one of my favorite anecdotes is that in European encyclopedias, right up through the Enlightenment, Okay, right up through Diderot's Encyclopédie and beyond. If you look up the entry on the dolphin, you will find in almost all encyclopedias that, it, that it, there's something in it that says, dolphins, by the way, answer to the name Simon. If you, if you see a dolphin and you call out Simon, it'll come to you because dolphins are named Simon for some reason. And so, for example, like this is a typical example here from a 17th century encyclopedia. Um, Simon, in zoology, a name by which some authors have called the dolphin. It is affirmed that this fish loves the name and will come to a person who calls him by it, um, and so on and so forth. So I found that you know, a lot of these encyclopedic texts have this kind of material in them, uh, and I was intrigued by why someone would, even if I mean, the fact that it's there doesn't prevent us from asking the question, why did they transmit it? So in the case of Anuaiti, you saw a general picture of what the contents look like, but I wanted to also give you a sense of what it looks like altogether, and just the, the amount of um, detail and complexity in the table of contents. This is, the, this is a translation of his table of contents, of just the first book, and you can see how diversified 
and ramified it is. And then we move into the second and third books, and you can, or this is just the second book, actually. And you can see just how, how uh, many different topics are covered in this enormous text. Third book, fourth book, and then the book on history. So by way of answering the question of why you would have needed to know all this, or why he was interested in preserving it, it, it made sense, of course, to look at his professional background. And he, was, he worked as a scribe as a, in the service of the Mamluk Sultanate. And he has a very interesting discussion of the education of the scribe within the encyclopedia itself. So here he's really talking about the chancery scribe, the person who works for what's called in Arabic the diwan al-insha, so the person who's in, um, in charge of writing letters to, to foreign leaders, um, really someone who's, who's producing um, very eloquent uh, documents that are dripping with you know, learned references to all kinds of things. So what does that person have to know? Well, the first thing that the scribe begins with is the memorization of the Book of God, Most High. That's where you start. So you begin by memorizing the Quran. Then you go on to memorizing a great number of prophetic hadiths, the traditions. Following this, the scribe should read whatever he can find of books about grammar, through which he will attain the objective, the objective of a knowledge of classical Arabic. Following this, he should read what is available to him in the way of lexicographical textbooks, in other words, dictionaries. Connected to this subject is a memorization of the sermons, speeches, dialogues, disputations, and letters of the most eloquent uh, companions of the prophet, as well as others. Then consider the battle days and wars of the Arabs and the names of the days that became proverbial for them and the poetry that was recited and the contests that took place on those days. By the way, this is all material that is centuries removed from his time. This material, much of it, is as removed from his time as we are to him. It's almost the same amount of time that separates this material from us to Anuadi. He's talking about this, this being the, the stuff that it's important for the scribe to know. After that, though, you've got the histories of different nations you need to know. And of course, you let him memorize the poetry of the Arabs and study the literary commentaries, clarifying the poetry's ambiguities. Then you should take in some anthologies of ancient poetry, the works of the modern poets like al mutanabbi and Al-Buhtari and so on, uh, the books of ancient proverbs. Um, and finally, these are the general matters that the aspirant to this craft cannot but help himself diligently to their study. If he does not do so, let him know that he will find himself in one valley while the craft of secretaryship will be in another. So this is the beginning. This is the beginning of one's um, education as a scribe before you get into anything technical. So if that is, in fact, if that's not too idealized a picture of how, uh, of what this class looked like at the time and what they knew then you can understand why they would be interested in things like this. On the clouds, the Thalibi wrote in his Science of Lexicography, when a cloud first rises, it is called Nashq. When it is dragged along in the air, it is called a Sahab. If it changes and makes the sky overcast, it is called al ghamam If a rain cloud rises at the edge of the sky such that you cannot see it, but you do hear its thunder, it is called al akr if it overshadows the sky, it is called al-arid. And if it has thunder and lightning, it is called al-arras. And so on and so forth. If it is black, it is called takhya or mutatakhtikha. If you see it and reckon that it is a rain cloud, it is called mukhayila. This is my favorite one. If its rain flows abundantly, it is called al-jaham. But it is also said that al-jaham is a cloud that does not contain any water at all. So what do we learn from? this kind of thing. The first thing that we learn is that he didn't know he didn't know these words. He had to read a lexicographical textbook in order to learn them, in order to understand the meaning, which is why I've translated, I've kept the Arabic terms there, um, because he is effectively glossing terms that are un, unfamiliar to him. So again, why? why? Why do you need to know this kind of thing? Maybe you need to know this kind of thing because you were called upon to reproduce eloquent um, phrases and, and verses in epistles, like, for example, on the cheetah. The poets and eloquent ones have excelled in their descriptions of cheetahs, both in poetry and prose. For example, we had with us cheetahs darting like lightning, 
faster than arrows loosed at a deserter, more intelligent than lions, more cunning than foxes, stealthier than scorpions, lank-hipped and empty-bellied, dappled of frame, red-cornered slits for eyes, open mouths, broad brows and wide necks, bearing teeth like spearheads. The cheetah spies the gazelle at great distance, knows its sounds, tracks its droppings and resting places, <coughs> scents its, its musk. For all we know, Inuiti never went on a hunt with cheetahs, um, although cheetahs were prized hunting animals at some point in Islamic history. Did he, were there cheetahs available uh, when he was writing this in Egypt? It's not clear, but he may have been called upon in the course of his chancery duties to write a letter to another sovereign who liked to hunt with cheetahs. And if he didn't know how to describe a cheetah accurately, um, or not accurately, but in a literary fashion, he would have been out of a job. So that's maybe, maybe an explanation for why this kind of stuff was so very important. On the other hand, I um, was very interested in the side of Anuaiti's experience, his bureaucratic experience, that had nothing to do with literature. In fact, I found that over time to be much more interesting because it was one of the few places in the text where you got a sense of the real, where it wasn't uh, so much a, the text wasn't, didn't reflect this canonical, archival, civilizational collection of things uh, drawn from Islamic history, but were actually a reflection of his time. And here I, I hope you'll see, also, you'll hope, hope you'll note the difference in the prose that comes through when he describes the, what the duties of the secretary of the army are as opposed to the chancery scribe. He writes, the Secretary of the Army must list the names of all the military commanders of different ranks who are paid with land grants, currency, or weighed fungible commodities. He should also list the Sultan's Mamluks, the non-Mamluk cavalrymen, and the Turkoman, Bedouin Arab chieftains. He must arrange these names alphabetically in a ledger and record beside each name the year when their prefecture or military service began and who held his land grant prior to him. The secretary should also indicate, beside each name, the fiscal value of the land grant by using a symbol rather than a plain number. And he should state the name of each soldier's commanding officer. In the case of the Turkoman and Bedouin tribesmen, he should list how many horses and camels they presented to the royal stables. With regards to the Egyptian Bedouins, he should list what they are stipulated to provide to the Sultan in exchange for their land grants, such as gifts, providing food for the postal horses, transporting produce, and so on and so forth. So, you read a passage like this, and all of a sudden, it's a, an intrusion of the real into the world of the encyclopedia. All of a sudden, you understand <coughs> how the machinery of government at this time actually worked. It wasn't a matter of, you have to know the different names for clouds because of the ur very urgent situation where you might have to like put that into a letter. OK, that's important for a very select few scribes who, who did this kind of thing. But most bureaucrats in the empire were doing things like this. They were keeping records of which tribesmen had supplied which, how many horses to the army, and how many, uh, which of them had to be paid in rice versus uh, debased silver, and which of them did not send money last year, and so they are in trouble this year. How this, how this kind of situation worked. Similarly, the Secretary of the Treasury, which is where Nwedi uh, probably spent most of his uh, experience, he writes, integrity and trustworthiness are the mainstays of this position. For the treasuries of kings in our age cannot be fully inventoried due to their size, abundant contents, and the immensity of their treasures. Were a scribe commissioned to prepare an account for the financial revenues of the Sultan's treasury for a single year, he would have to be appointed solely to this task for an entire year without working on anything else. By the time the account was complete, at the end of the second year, and corrected by the Secretary of the Treasury during the third year, its anticipated benefit would have long passed. Furthermore, the Secretary of the Treasury would have neglected the receipts of the third year, having been occupied with the first year's bookkeeping. So you get a sense of just how, how much information they, these kinds of um, officials were dealing with on a daily basis in the course of their, just their professional lives and why this sort of um, mentality or this sensitivity to record keeping and archival practices would have led a person like this when he retired to, to try to want to make sense of the world in that way. 
Other, another lovely example that, I, that is in the book is um, the kinds of things you would have to know. For example, examples of marriage contracts, but not just any marriage contract, which any average notary could, could do in Cairo or Damascus. What about a marriage contract between, a, between two deaf mutes? You might need to know. That happens, apparently, right? This happens. How do you deal with that? Well, if a man who is mute and deaf marries a woman who, can't, who, who can speak, no, this, this is actually not words two. The contract should read, here is the bridal dowry that so-and-so, the mute and deaf man, has presented to so-and-so, Jane Doe, his proposed wife, being of sound mind and aware that what is legally required of him, communicating through gestures that are understandable by his witnesses and impossible to de deny by anyone who observes him. Upon agreement, the contract sh should conclude. The husband indicated his assent to this contract through under understandable gestures. Kind of amazing. And if both husband and wife are mute and deaf, the contract should read, here's the bridal dowry that so-and-so has presented to so-and-so, each of them being mute and deaf, sound of mind and vision, aware of his or her legal responsibilities, having made that clear through gestures which the witnesses of this contract understand. Finally, if the husband is a eunuch, the end of the contract should read, the wife knows that her husband is a eunuch who is not capable of sexual intercourse, and she consents to him. So why, why is this interesting? It's interesting to me, OK, it's interesting in a kind of like, weren't you know, the past is a foreign country. Um, it's also interesting from the perspective of, is it really? How much of a foreign country is it? A lot of the scholarship in my field um, has has tended to approach the Mamluk Empire and other pre-modern Islamic states um, from the perspective of uh, the primacy of, let's say, social action, functionalism, to explain how societies work, that it's all about, it's all, it's all about bonds of loyalty, it's all about informal um, arrangements between um, people and communities, um, that it, can, it should not be understood through the notion of agencies through the, through the state, the, the idea of the state um, is uh, it's always accompanied by this uh, when we talk about pre-modern Islamic polities um, before the late Ottoman Empire. And when you read these kinds of texts, you, fi you find yourself reconsidering that. Um, it, if, it, if these places were not quite paper states, if they weren't entirely, obviously not modern states, um, I think we also have to look carefully at this kind of culture of documentation and record keeping, um, which I found very interesting while translating um, this work. So the last thing I want to point out about the, the encyclopedia is that um, a, a work this size um, that contains so, many, so much um, material from different disciplines and genres is naturally going to have a tremendous amount of contradiction <coughs> in it. Um, this is what, you know, when Borges says that he describes encyclopedic, uh, this mythical encyclopedia that he, that he comes upon, he describes it as having no visible doctrinal purpose or hint of parody. And that's also the, the feeling you get when reading Arabic, is, um, Arabic encyclopedic works from this period, is that there's just so much in there that, that doesn't make sense or would seem to be self-contradictory. Um, in his long discussion of um, homosexuality and the behavior of homo you know, how we should think about homosexuality legally and what the Quran says about it and what the Hadith says about it and what the different schools of law say about it, it's, it's very clear that homosexuality is something that should not, that is illegal from uh, in this particular intellectual tradition. It's followed immediately by a long chapter on how the, the, the male beloved has been described in poetry, which doesn't make sense. I mean, how, how, how is he able to have these two things in his brain at the same time and not see that one of them, uh, that, they, that they were self-contradictory? So for example, we have poetry like um, a very famous um, author of this kind of verse, Abu Nuwas, <coughs> said, his face like a full moon with a gazelle's eyes, the body of a boy, and the coquetry of a girl, in public a man, in private a woman, exciting me with his curls and ringlets above a smooth cheek, lighting up the gloom. And uh, Fadl al-Raqashi, 
writing of his male beloved, that sly and brilliant one who grows girlish in his impudence. He appears manly at first, but after a drink is suddenly a woman. When you tell him, baby, say Moses, he lisps moistly, motheth. He embraces me until morning, trading stories with me in the dark. So this, this particular verse, there's, people have responded to this saying, oh my god, we need a history of the homoerotic lisp. Where did this come from? Uh, and apparently that's a thing. There is actually there's work that's been done on this, uh, the question of the homoerotic lisp and how it translates across cultures. So again, this particular chapter follows a chapter about homosexuality and how it, uh, and, it and the legal content of, um, of you know, fatwas about it and so on. By the same token, on wine, we have a discussion of wine, what the Quran says about wine, the, the multivalent Quranic discourse on wine, uh, what, the hadith, what the hadith says, what the what legal schools say. But then, immediately after that, so he says, among the afflictions of wine is that it disgraces the drinker because of its lingering smell leading people to avoid him out of shame, caution, and fear. It is impossible to, de to deny having drunk wine when its smell is present. Governors can punish someone on the basis of smelling wine under breath because the smell remains in the mouth for two days after drinking it. So anyone who drinks some wine and is ashamed to go out amongst people for fear of the smell being discernible must remain secluded at home until his drunkenness recedes, his sobriety returns, and the smell dissipates. Immediately following this discussion, he says, some drinkers have developed a trick to remove the smell of wine from their mouths, treating it with medicines that they concoct and consume after drinking. The finest of these medicines is produced by taking equal parts colocynth, fennel, galangale, elecampane, and cloves, along with two parts gum arabic. They are all pounded together, combined with rose water, and then consumed. And then he says, this medicine does indeed remove the smell of wine from one's <laughs> breath, just as they claim. So he had tried it. I mean, how does that make sense? Um, so this is what I mean by the contradiction of this genre, of this discourse, is that um, when, you, when you spend enough time looking at it and taking it all in, you realize how interpenetrated it is. And that is not because he threw everything, including the kitchen sink, into this work and didn't give thought as to how it held together. There is too much evidence, as I write in this, in this other book, um, the study of the work, there's just too much evidence that he knew exactly what he was doing. And the work is completely, um, uh, it's very purposefully composed. There's cross-references all over the text that show that he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew what, what he was going to include, what he wasn't going to include. Um, so, you know, I think it gives us license to read the contradictions as, as part of his project. And then I, I'll just le uh, end with something that, uh, uh, we've had many, um, I've been lucky to have uh, several things published from the book in the press and people tend to gravitate towards the sexual stuff and there's a lot of sexual material in the book. Um, recipes for aphrodisiacs, recipes for um, contraceptives, uh, things that will prevent pregnancy but things that will also encourage pregnancy, things that will produce uh, indescribable pleasure both for the man and the woman. Um, and so this is just a typical one uh, that he has, that has a, you know, he, one of his jobs, um, and Nawadi's jobs was uh, the administrator of, of one of the most important hospitals in Cairo. Um, so he spent four years overseeing the Bimaristan al-Mansuri and was very interested in, um, in the staff there. Um, he describes working with them and, and, um, and interacting with the physicians, and so he had, a, he had an interest in, in pharmacopoeial materials or, or matters. Um, so this is the kind of thing that, um, that you also find there. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So I think um, we've got a little bit of time. I have to dash to teach at about five minutes to one. Um, so I think we've got about maybe 15 or 20 minutes, if anybody has any questions or comments. Adi? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say something about uh, how you work against this immense effort of compilation in selecting this uh, in the book? Uh, what was your... Yeah. 
And also uh, about this distinction that you made so clearly between uh, what, it, what was really real there and all the things that make no sense. Uh, I think that we need to uh, historicize this distinction between the real and the unreal, or the imaginary, or the illusionary, or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that we problematize uh, some of these classifications. Yeah. Um, the first, I have to repeat the question because we don't have microphones. The first question was about um, selection. And um, yeah, condensing the, the work from 33 volumes to one is a laughable um, challenge. Um, and so what I tried to do was, what was most important to me was to have as much, um, of, as, as much subject matter from the, from the encyclopedia represented in the translation as possible. Uh, which meant very short selections from as many different chapters as possible, rather than longer selections from short, from you know, from a fewer number of chapters. So that means that I had to basically, I mean, I had to jettison uh, volumes of material, and I just decided in certain cases to not even have anything on certain subjects because there's no way to to, to treat it. Um, so, like, how do you how do you cover the the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, which has you know it's covered in a couple of volumes. How do you do that in a couple of paragraphs? It would have been a joke. Um, so, and this is most evident in, in the historical portion of the encyclopedia, where I decide um, really, the, the historical portion is the largest part of the encyclopedia. And so what I decided was to give you the beginning of history and the end of history, and nothing in between. Um, so I gave you this his story of the, of the, the Adam and Eve narrative, the, uh, essentially God's creation, uh, the creation narrative as it is given in the text, and then I, and then I give you the events of his lifetime. Uh, not all of them, obviously, but things that I found interesting in the events of his lifetime. Um, the other question about the difference between the real and the, what you could call the empirical or the literary empirical, uh, I do think it needs to be um, definitely thought about. I don't know how you would historicize it. But certainly, there's been a lot of interesting work in um, the study of medieval European encyclopedias that deals with um, this, this this idea of uh, Foucault's idea of la prose du monde, like you know the notion of of um, the world versus text, essentially. And I mentioned uh, Nuetti's his accounts of his lifetime. I'll give you a, a great example of of. Um, of the, the difference between these two modes. In his chapter on the hippopotamus that falls in the zoological section, he says the hippopotamus, as we all know, has, um, it is cloven-footed like a cow, and it neighs like a horse, and it has uh, the tail of a pig, and, um, and it has a very curious feature where it, when it, uh, it lives in Egypt, by the way, and when it comes out of the, the river in Egypt, and to go eat on the, on the banks, it doesn't come out of the river and start eating. It comes out of the river and it crosses the section, the amount of distance that it wants to eat, and it turns around and it eats its way back to the river, okay? I mean, it's, it's like a typewriter. It comes out, it goes like that, turns, and it comes back and it eats. Its, it always wants to be eating towards the river. Just the most bizarre thing you could think of, right? And as it, as it turns out, this, this whole thing is from, all these ideas are from ancient writers. I mean, the cloven-footed uh, hippopotamus is from Aristotle. The, the neighing like a horse, squeaking, um, neighing like a horse, and the, the pig's tail is from Aristotle. The, the typewriter motion is from Al-Jahiz, you know, again, like almost half a millennium before um, in Nuwaiti. When you jump to the historical section of the encyclopedia, where he's talking about the events of his lifetime, he says, in the year 1303, a hippopotamus was discovered in the Nile. We've never seen a hippopotamus before. It was amazing. It was hunted in the Nile. He had just told us earlier in the encyclopedia that they live in Egypt, and they are this and that. And he describes, he describes the hippopotamus in, in like minute detail because after it was hunted, it was brought to the sultan, and it was stuffed, and they would put it up on its legs so that he could, they could gaze at it. They'd never seen one before. And in Nuaidi, being one of the close advisors of the sultan, he stood there and he looked at, the, looked at this thing. 
And he describes in the historical section, this is what it looked like. He tells you exactly how much it weighed, what its length was, and he says it has a three-chambered stomach. They do have three-chambered stomachs. He says it has four toes. They have four toes. He described the thickness of its height. So the question then is, why, don't, why didn't you go back and erase the your description of the hippopotamus before, or get rid of it, or replace it. You've seen one now. Why don't you say, this is what the hippopotamus is. Forget Aristotle and Jahaz. They didn't know what they were talking about. Why? You have seen one, right? They, they, they did not do that. And it wasn't just them that did not do it. Medieval writer, encyclopedic writers in every tradition had a kind of like epistemological tight-fistedness where they would not let go of authoritative material. And it had nothing... The material is valuable regardless of its truth value. It had nothing to do with its, um, with its ontological accuracy. It, had something, it either was valuable as cultural capital, or you know, it was the kind of thing that if you were going to talk about a hippopotamus in a letter, you had to use the Aristotelian hippopotamus, not the one that you saw yesterday. Um, so it had cultural capital, but maybe it had, I think there's many different ways we could answer that question. trustworthy. And, and so related to this, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any sense of what makes somebody trustworthy mm -hmm. uh, because that's clearly critical to uh, uh, this kind of a text. I'm just, just wondering if, if he's making any authorial intervention about what a trustworthy person mm -hmm. or author might be like. I th my sense is that this particular author was very um, charitable in the sense that he was motivated by principles of charity, uh, where he was, he really wanted to hold on to as much as possible, and he wasn't so concerned with um, trustworthiness as some of other, some other encyclopedists. The, the fellow who produced the manuscript with the, the, the drawing that you saw of the citrus tree, uh, another encyclopedist who lived, who was a contemporary of Anoides, who also worked for the government, had the same profile. He came from a very uh, important um, scribal family. He has a different approach. Um, he, in a certain way, is kind of revolutionary, where he says in the preface to his encyclopedia, I want to get rid of all of that outdated material. He says, the uh, encyclopedias at this time are full of stuff that has no relevance anymore. It's just dross. Like, we, we need to get rid of it. We need to shed it. Um, and he says, I have not put anything inside this encyclopedia that I have not fact-checked. And the way that he does it, he says, I, uh, everybody who comes to me, and me being the, the scribe at, you know, in the service of an empire, I get to meet people from all over the world. And, every, whenever, and, I, and I interrogate them about their, about their countries and their rulers and their styles of dress and everything. And I, but I will not put any testimony into my book until I have corroborated it against three or four other people. And he says that I also will go back to a person after I've given them a time in which they will, could have forgotten what they told me. And I ask them the same question. And if they repeat the thing that they said before, then, OK, it makes it. Otherwise, I just throw their testimony away. But he was really the exception that proves the rule. I mean, most, most um, encyclopedists up through and past the Enlightenment are not nearly as exacting about this idea of objectivity. Um, so. Why think of it as a contradiction at all right. if it's a compendium of knowledge? That's one question. My second question is I was noting the eloquence of the English translations. How did you decide which words to leave in Arabic? Like, what was your boundary there? Yeah. Um, so on the, I, I think you're right about the contradiction issue. Um, and clearly, Noeti didn't understand contradiction in this way. Um, one of, my, one of my advisors for my dissertation was a Europeanist um, who works on encyclopedic literature, Anne Blair. And one of the things that she, told, she asked me was, how does he conceive of contradiction? Does he conceive of contradiction? You, I was using these terms kind of cavalierly, and she, she said, you know, no, no, you have to back up. Like, does he even think that this is a contradiction, the, having these two things next to each other? Um, so I think you're right. Uh, I shouldn't, um, I'm, I'm using that in a kind of analytical way to say, well, these things obviously contradict each other, but he didn't conceive of them that way. And um, for the translations, I've, tr I've left things, uh, I translate everything, 
But so the places where I've left things um, in Arabic, it's when I've sensed that he, um, that they weren't native to him, that the, the terms were not familiar to him. And the purpose of their inclusion in the, in the text was in order to be a gloss. Um, so he was introducing the terms to his readers. And so in that case, it kind of makes sense to have them in the Arabic, um, encountering them the way his readers would have encountered them. But in every instance, he also gives it English. Not in every instance. Like in those ones where I say, you know, if the, if the wind, or for example, like um, the, he has like a chapter on different kinds of dust. And he says, you know, the dust that swirls around the, uh, the dust of battle is al khaydara and the dust of feet is al athyar and the dust that is stirred up by the, by the hooves of horses is blah, blah, blah. Those terms were not familiar to his readers. I mean, they, they would have read them in a poem, but they didn't know what, they've never, they'd never used al athyar to talk about their dirty feet. So he was telling them what al athyar was, um, and so the gloss is the fact that he said, the dust of feet means this. So it wouldn't have made sense for me to say the dust of feet was, and then find some English term that corresponds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, as a Jewish person, I about how like the 14th and 15th century was like time of encyclopedic writing in the Arabic world. So like why was that? And also like what was like the, um, so like you also said that this writing was not really like recognized or like was it thought as great at that time? So, like, why is that? Um, I didn't get the second part. That that, I, that the that writing was. So, like, why wasn't it like thought to be like incredible? Like, for because I know that the encyclopedia like, that was produced in like 18th century in like, Europe was like, oh, like, like this very recognized mm -hmm. and like. Oh yes, yes. Okay. Value. Right. Um, so the question of why this period um, produced this kind of literature. Um, I probably need at least as much time um, as I've had already to try to explain that, because that's really the subject of my next book. But um, certainly some of the things that came up in this talk, uh, the prevalence of his um, the professional training um, that so many large-scale compilers at this time had. A lot of them were had served as bureaucrats. Um, and so that's one argument. The other argument has to do with the fact that um, Cairo and Damascus at this time are are the centers of the world. I mean, Cairo especially is the center of the Islamic world, and the the Mongol conquests that moved through um, Eurasia in the previous century basically send a lot of learned people um, towards Cairo, and there is a sense in in the in the cultural production of this time that of a kind of overcrowding of knowledge. Uh, that there's so many different sources of knowledge, books certainly, uh, but also learned people who are in Cairo. And Cairo becomes a city of colleges. There's um, hundreds and hundreds of educational institutions. So um, I argue in this new book that basically it's out of that kind of matrix that we see uh, people needing to try to make sense of this kind of inf time of information overload through the writing of these kinds of compendia. Maybe one more question? Yeah. What drew you to translate this particular encyclopedia if there were so many available from this time period? Um, well, it was, I wasn't about, oh yeah, what drew me to translate this particular work? Um, I wasn't about to go read another one. Um, I, I, had, I had already read this one, um, and I thought that it would be, you know, terrific as a just as a great candidate for um, people to to get to know the encyclopedic legacy of the Islamic world, and um, you know, it's really del it's a delightful text. Um, so, yeah. I may follow. Yeah. Can you compare it to the other texts? Is it very typical? Or is it exceptional? Does it represent a new development at a particular period, or does it have similar? Can you just yeah. say more about the... Topic? Yeah, in certain ways, it's very rep representative of an encyclopedic tradition that belongs to an earlier time, too. It looks like a lot like, um, in its contents, it looks a lot like what we see in the Abbasid period. Um, but I do think that there are, it has a lot of innovations. Um, certainly, the way that it's organized, it's ex incredibly systematic, reflects a different level of, um, of development in this kind of textual production. Um, so... Uh, but yeah, I think it is, it's probably emblematic of the, of the genre.
Yeah. How long does it continue? How long what? Yeah, like um, after the Mamluks. Oh, Arabs, I see. The Arabs don't write these things. Yeah. The Arabs continue to write encyclopedias. Um, they do. I mean, the, the encyclopedic um, moment, I think, continues certainly through the 15th century. Um, we get enormous texts and dictionaries and biographical dictionaries produced. Um, Right. So there's a, that's another question. Is what is an encyclopedia? Uh, what am I talking about here? How do you define it? Um, and that's also a huge subject that I get into in this next book. Um, but under the Ottomans, I mean, we have lots of things that could be called encyclopedic, certainly are, are encyclopedic in certain ways. Where there's a, a kind of a rise of miscellanism, writing um, you know, anthologies of different kinds, putting different texts together in different ways. Um, and you know, in the 17th century, in um, in Istanbul, it, there's more work now that's that's showing that you know um, that there was a kind of moment, encyclopedic moment, with you know bi bio bi bibliographical works like Kashf al Dunun, Khatib Chalabi's materials. Yeah, I, I, I didn't ask that. Um, I meant the literature in Arabic. In Arabic, right? Continued until the genre. The genre. Right. Um, it continues, but it's um, actually, you know, the Arabic literature in the context of the Ottomans is not very well studied at all. It's sort of the, the terra incognita. So we know of things, but we don't really understand a lot of Arabic literature produced um, in the, certainly in the 16th and 17th centuries. It's still, you know, very, very much un underdeveloped, I would say. Mm -hmm. I think. All right. Thank you very much.